Hello everybody, Richard Hart here. I hope you heard about Sam Bankman Freed's trial. He was convicted. He was found guilty on all charges. Now, this is in one way a vindication uh, for all of the things that I've been promoting, where cryptocurrency was invented to get rid of middlemen. Don't pick up pennies in front of freight trains. Don't give your keys to somebody else. Uh, but in another way, it's actually uh, a sad story for crypto because the bankruptcy, they're just selling the coins. So I don't know how that furthers uh, cryptocurrency or helps uh, the movement. But uh, yeah, so while it's nice that uh, laws exist and they're enforced and sometimes people that do evil are caught, um, it's not so nice that they then dump on your head. It's not as great. Maybe there's some upside I'm not thinking about. Um, yeah, but in the end, you know, when people celebrate <laughs> cryptocurrencies going bankrupt, like so many that I've warned you about, you know, um, I warned you about Celsius. They went bankrupt. Mashinsky's in jail. I faced him in live stream, you know, told him, not your keys, not your coins. This industry was invented to get rid of middlemen. You're a middleman. You want to take people's custody away from them. And it's not really custody. Um, that's something else I've been trying to get everyone to use better language. The language that we, uh, people that were so early in cryptocurrency, have used to try and make it easier for new people to understand this, you know, life-changing computer science breakthrough, cutting-edge technology, uh, those shortcuts in language are now being used against the cryptocurrency industry. So when people wanted to understand, you know, oh, well, it, what's a wallet? Wallets don't actually exist. It's a lie. It's misleading. In the real world, a wallet is what you put physical things into. In cryptocurrency, there are no physical things. In digital assets, there are no physical things. They're digital. So if... Well, you can have a physical representation of something digital like a CD, but that's not what cryptocurrencies are. So if you have a, a wallet, it's actually a keychain. And you can make a copy of your wallet, and it makes a copy of your keys. And that analogy holds. But the analogy with a normal wallet, uh, can you make a copy of your wallet and does your money get copied? Probably illegal. So, you know, there's a difference between data and printed currency. There's a difference between data and coins. And so a centralized database that you know a key to is vastly different than having custody of something. Vastly different. And, you know, the government is running into huge problems with misunderstanding. Um, and it's it's screwing up their, their execution on the intention to, to write good rules or good law because they just don't understand the technology and you guys are part to blame. Yeah, you guys and even a little bit me. So I said, uh, you heard me use the word custody a minute ago and then I had to stop myself because you get used to these habits of an imprecise language. You cannot custody a cryptocurrency. You can just know a key and you can't even use that key to move coins, and there aren't coins, and they don't move. They're sitting in the same chain they always were. It's the same database. Database didn't change. You just updated some values in it. So there isn't any such thing as transfer. There isn't any such thing as custody. It, these are all mistakes of understanding that now are coming to bite the industry, and we have to do better. We have to educate better. Um, so you do not have a wallet. You have a keychain. You cannot custody cryptocurrency, you can only know the key, and you can only update the database. That's it. And, and here's the funny part. You can't even update the database. The only people that can update the database are miners and validators. So unless you're a miner or a validator, you can just ask nicely or maybe uh, include a fee to somebody to include you in the database. Even knowing the keys doesn't allow you to update the database. So there's so many levels of misunderstanding and it and it would be it would be you know if there wasn't such an attack on the industry um or if there wasn't so much misunderstanding 
And if the misunderstandings weren't being used for evil, it wouldn't be that bad. But they are being used for evil. You know, Elizabeth Warren is uh, in Congress saying that very bad dudes are raising hundreds of millions of dollars with crypto. And then the math gets checked. And no, actually, that was off by almost 100%. Uh, It was off by 99%. Um, Yeah, so you just lied 100x to Congress. That's not good. (laughs) You know? And who's responsible that? In part, these people that for a living steal your privacy from you. That's not great. (laughs) You have a right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure in the United States. It's called the Fourth Amendment. You have a right to privacy by the United Nations and signatories to their documents. You know, you can go on Wikipedia and look up your rights to privacy. You have a right to privacy, and you know who really, really understands the right to privacy? Governments, because they do everything they can to keep stuff private from you, which is funny is they're public entities, but, you know, start, you, you're lucky that a Freedom of Information Act was even passed. And you're lucky that they reply with any documents because, man, governments love their privacy. So they under, you know, and anyone that ever doubts the value of privacy, you're like, well, okay, a couple of things. One, I'll have your email password now. Two, I'd like to see your search history. Three, hey, take your clothes off. Let's see what's up. Why not? Since you don't think privacy matters. So <laughs> if you don't think privacy matters, you're probably not a good human and you're not in line with what the founding fathers enshrined in the documents that have allowed America to do as well as it has. So, yeah, privacy is a human right, and people that villainize it and demonize it so often have skeletons in their closet that come out when their privacy gets beat. So you're like, hey, isn't that weird? The people that hate privacy the most have so much to hide. Hmm, odd. <clears throat> so, yeah, in summary, Sam Bankman Freed's conviction, probably good for justice. I'm not sure. You know, when you look at the United States and you think here is a nation that has the highest rate of incarceration of any nation in the history of mankind, and you think to yourself, is that is that good? Because what happens to the people that get put in jail? You pay for people to guard them. You pay to feed them. You pay to house them. You pay to clothe them. You pay for a lot of stuff. They're no longer productive members of society, by and large. So incarcerating people... It might be good for the prison industrial complex, bottom line, profit, but it's probably not so good for society at large. And, you know, when you, when you profitize people being in jail, you, you want repeat business as a company. So why would you, and, and they have a fancy word for this, it's called recidivism. I don't even know if I said it right. Uh, and it basically means that people that commit crime and go to jail are more likely to return and be repeat customers for the prison industrial complex. In the United States, there was actually a judge that went to jail in a scandal called uh, Kids for Profit or something, where he would get paid by the kid that he sent to juvenile prison. If you can put a jail in, uh, if you can put a judge in jail, man, he must have really made uh, some bad errors. And and it happens, right? It's just like you saw in Ross Ulbricht's case: the FBI tried to steal his coins and flee the country, literally, the FBI agents. People forget this. <laughs> You're like, hey, wait a second. Uh, that's not enforcing the law. What's going on here? So I don't think that the Sam Bankman Freed case is – it's it's a partial victory in that a bad guy isn't able to do bad as much as he was. So that's nice. Um, it's not really a, victo- a victory for the prices of those cryptocurrencies that are being dumped by the uh, – the bankruptcy trustees, and it's not a victory for public awareness of crypto because everyone associated Sam Bankman-Fried with crypto. They could have as easily associated him with funding Democrats because that's what he did with so many hundreds of millions of dollars, I think. I think it was hundreds of millions. Who knows? Maybe it was only decamillions. Um but he didn't get associated with funding Democrats. He got associated with crypto. It's really weird because he's the opposite of crypto. But it wasn't the opposite of donating, right? His donations spent as well as everybody else's donations. Um, but, you know, the things he did with crypto were the opposite of crypto. Not your keys, not your coins. Don't pick up pennies in front of freight trains. And, it, and it's, it's a little bit weird 
that you have that the Bahamas has to rely on the United States to do its law enforcement for it because you know I'm not an expert but I think that company was based in the Bahamas. Well, uh, you know, I begged you not to send your money to middlemen. I begged you to not pick up pennies and freight trains. I begged you to reduce your counterparty risk, which is why cryptocurrency was invented. And I've been shown right over and over and over and over again through all the failures, all the arrests, all the bankruptcies. While, mind you, the things I've invented that follow the true core principles of cryptocurrency, of decentralization, of self-reliance, of no middlemen, they've operated flawlessly for years. Hex has operated flawlessly for years while everything else around it has failed so often. Pulse Chain has launched and operated flawlessly for five months now. I don't know what you're supposed to do to win any harder. I, I think it's funny that people still listen to losers in cryptocurrency. If you are owed money by the FTX estate, you might not want to run your mouth about how to save people because you got yourself wrecked. If you are owed money from Celsius, you might not want to run your mouth because you are uh, you got yourself scammed and you probably promoted it and probably got other people scammed or at least didn't speak out as loudly against it as I did. I faced these people in person. I fa- Well, in person, <laughs> digitally. I faced Mashinsky live and explained to him how what he was doing is the opposite of why crypto was invented. I was right. He was wrong. Um, And then the people that get listened to in this space are just wild. Uh, People listen to ex-convicts. I don't know, man. I I don't want to, I don't want to be the guy. So first of all, I, I, I may have, I only known one ex-convict in my life. I don't, I haven't known many, but I knew one guy that was an ex-convict and he was a nice guy. He was a good guy, you know, that did some bad, bad stuff. So I'm not an expert on ex-cons. I've maybe to the best of my knowledge known one, um, in my life. But I think in general, if a person has done very bad things, you have to look out and watch out. I, I'll give you an example. There's a tweet hidden, um, on the Richard Hart Twitter somewhere about, uh, you know, giving people a second chance, but watching out because they might fall back into their old habits. There was a time when uh, Ben Armstrong, you know, promoted a lot of uh, bad stuff or stuff that I, I, I wouldn't like. And then he kind of changed his tune and he stopped doing that. And he started trying to get, you know, better laws passed. And he started to to call out the, you know, crap going on with the FTX. And he went down to the Bahamas and tried to investigate and, and tried to actually help people get screwed over less by the guy. And those were, I believe, honest endeavors. And so the tweet at the time was, you know, people that did bad stuff can start to do good stuff, but you got to watch out because they can get back into bad stuff again. And so it happened with... Uh, with Ben is, is unfortunate because he fell back into drugs. Um, and now, you know, he's selling a paid indicator and he's selling his uh, Rolex and he's selling his Lambo or he, it might not even been his Lambo. I'm not sure the whole story on it. And so, you know, we keep getting these kind of lukewarm, not so great examples of look, Richard Hart was right again. But it's unfortunate that the things he's predicting are kind of a story that we've seen a thousand times before. Um, People, when tempted, very, very often will fall for that temptation. So it's, uh, it's unfortunate. It's sad. And guess what, guys? I'm the rock. I'm the giving tree. I am here... I am promoting the things that will make the world a better place. They are working. The things that I have invented or the ideas that I have come up with are working flawlessly. Nearly all of them. Um, You know, I called the Bitcoin top at 65K. Now it's 34K. I said, you know, two weeks after the last Bitcoin top, Ethereum crashed. 
And then two weeks after my Bitcoin top call was right, Ethereum crashed. Ethereum is down 64, 65%. Bitcoin's down 50%. Everyone else told you Bitcoin was going to 100K. Now, I think if Bitcoin will eventually get there. Um, now, I'm not a professional, I'm not a financial advisor. Do your own research. You know, not financial advice. All the litany of disclaimers I have to give you because my free speech is crippled. Um, my First Amendment rights are in uh, are being chilled and living in terror as are everyone else on the internet, right? I I did a hand-washing video on how to wash your hands properly when uh, COVID was uh, busier and uh, got my channel banned. Okay, I guess I shouldn't have taught people how to wash their hands, you know? Um, Yeah, so I warned you about people falling into old habits, people falling into old habits. I warned you about counterparty risk and middlemen. You guys got all your coins jacked. Not that there are actually coins, your database values. It's going to be hard to upgrade this language <laughs> in real time, man. It's easier to keep it right in writing, but in, in real time language, it's a little bit harder. And, uh, you know, the, the industry is still full of scumbags. So let's take coin market cap. Are they still lying about Hex's market cap? Yep. Going coin gecko. Still, still pretending that the coin doesn't have market cap. Yep. Uh, people, you know, people, you're just like, I've, I, it has been reported to me that people say things that don't make any sense. Like, ah, that Richard Hart, you know, he disappeared. You're like, really? Am I not here? That's funny. Cause, uh, <laughs> I wake up and I work really hard until I fall asleep and I do it every day and I don't take any days off. And I focus on getting things done and I'm getting the results. And we have two weeks more on the IRS rule because I made it popular to comment on. And now I think it's got 40,000 plus comments and I wouldn't be surprised if there was more. Now, I hope that those comments are relevant and substantive and not just copy pasting the same crap because I don't think 100 copies of the same thing is anywhere close to as useful as rotating through all the perspectives. And presenting those perspectives in the most compelling light, you know, it, it say, reading the same books a hundred times, reading the same book a hundred times probably isn't as good as reading a hundred different books. Um, you you do, you do democracy the best service by putting an effort and copy and pasting the same crap as everybody else is, is not exactly effort. And now that you have artificial intelligence to help educate yourself and to research all of human knowledge instantly. And if you're running it locally, privately, um, you know, I've written you the guides. I've given you the links. You can educate yourself faster and more efficiently and even have it write you a, an essay about a topic to understand it. It's a, and you can have it write it in the voice of a Supreme Court judge. What better education do you want? Does it doesn't get better than that. Unless you've got a real Supreme Court judge to like uh, educate a person, maybe that's better. But those are in short supply. And by the way, as far as Supreme Court goes, thank goodness we have checks and balances in the United States to maintain um, a functioning, effective government. It's up for debate how well that's working. Um, but what I do know is that the SEC has lost four of its five last cases, and the Supreme Court has granted censure. If I'm saying it right which basically means they're going to hear the case of uh, another case with the SEC. So, you know, and they were just found arbitrary and capricious for a second time in the SB21, SB121 uh, rule against cryptocurrency. Uh, they were trying to pretend it wasn't a rule, so they didn't have to do notice and comment, and then they didn't have to, you know, notify Congress in a certain way. You're just like, yeah, you guys got busted by the government accounting office, the GAO. You know, stop breaking the law. You fo- you write rules for a living. Follow the rules. And then they also, you know, they lost their case against XRP trying to claim that every XRP token was a security. The judge said, nope, that doesn't make any sense. These are blind purchases. They didn't even know who they're buying from. Get, get out of here. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there was a, I think there was an article in the New York, the Wall Street Journal, 
um, yesterday, the day before that just said, is Gary Gensler going to ever win a case? And, you know, there's even somebody apparently buying television ads, 30 and 60 second television ads against Gary Gensler. I don't really understand the logic behind it. Um, I don't think he's running for office. So what are people not going to vote for him? I I don't, (laughs) I don't really understand. I mean, Hey, if, if you have a, money and a platform and you want to spread truth and you think that's truth okay it seems well within the first amendment but i'm not sure like i don't really know what the big upside is to convincing everyone that gary gensler isn't that good at his job so like and then what i I don't get it i don't know what the end game is there so we got uh ben armstrong kind of fell off the wagon we got uh which I hope, you know, Ben, I hope it works out for you, man. I hope that, uh, hope you're able to get it together. I've, I've been very lucky. I've never had any problem with substances at all. Barely ever drink, don't do drugs. You know, it, it works for me. But what I want is to be more powerful. I want to make a difference in the world. I want to make an impact. I want to heal people. I want to help people. And being dizzy, it doesn't help. It doesn't help get that done. And I'm funny enough, I don't need to, I don't need to, like, ratchet up the humor with some, like, confusion, you know? Like, my, I work just fine as is. I don't need to screw up the system. What else do we got going on? Um, you know, I try and tell people the truth even when it, it hurts, and it hurts me. So, you know, to, I, I always wore a black shirt and, you know, didn't spend any money on anything and it wasn't really working for like getting the word out right i got a self-help book i I want people to read and improve their lives with it's free i've got uh things that i care about politics you know i've got videos and on my political beliefs and how we can make the world better and, and how you should find things you agree on instead of just things that are different which is the opposite of what the news does the news is always looking for difference never for commonality and it hurts the democratic process you know, so I like ranked list voting. I like a lot of stuff. Um, you should check out a guy called Vivek Ramaswamy. He's got a weird name, uh, but he's got some cool policies. And some of those policies, you know, like uh, having a voting test. If you can't become an American without a test on American values and history, well, why are you allowed to, like, screw up the democracy? You can't cut hair without a license. You can't do electrical work without a license. You can't do air conditioning work without a license. You can't drive without a license. So why are you allowed to screw up the democracy without a license? Now, there's a big risk, right? Like, whoever writes the test could format the test in a way that certain people just fail it. You could kind of cancel that out by getting the agreement of, you know, different various demographics of people so that it could be a fair test. And by the way, if you're unable to create a fair test, then what is that test you're giving people for citizenship already? I'm curious. Just use the same test. Now, obviously, I don't think that's ideal, but it it would probably receive the least blowback. So if you have better voters choosing from a better pool of candidates, because I think they should get paid more, if you want your democracy to work well, it has to pay competitive rates to the the private sector, period. Um, So if you have better candidates... With better voters, with a better voting system using ranked lists, you should get better outcomes. And so Vivek, he, he like has some of these similar ideas, which is insane because, you know, no one's ever brought these ideas up that I've ever seen <laughs> in a debate ever, you know. <clears throat> also, hey, a lot of people with weird names have won. So like Obama won, weird name. So maybe... Ramaswamy isn't that bad. Long story short, every day I wake up and I work until I go to sleep seven days a week. I'm trying to make the world a better place. And I hope that you see through my actions how much I care about you and how much my my eye is on the ball, on the things that I think will help your life the most. I don't live in the United States. I haven't lived in the United States since 2003. It's 20 years. But here I am out of the kindness of my heart trying to make it a better place. I don't have to do that. I don't have to spend my time trying to make democracy work better. I don't have to spend my time, you know, 
making the recording that I'm making now. I don't have to do this, but I do it because I care. And it's making a difference. It's making an impact. It is working. It, and if I died right now, you might you might have noticed that go.hex.com is a collection of links to code that you can run a bunch of different ways. Why is that? Why is go.hex.com a collection of links to software that you can run? Because it's your choice. You choose what code you're going to run on your computer. You chose what people you're going to communicate with. You, you make all the choices. You have all the power. And you have all the privacy. Even if you want to be stupid and give your privacy away, you can't. There's no contact us form. There's no email. There's no phone number. There's no way for you to de-anonymize yourself. There's no way for you to throw your privacy in the garbage. There's no logs. There's no Google Analytics. You can double-click a zip file and run the code from your desktop. You can view the source online. You can go to IPFS and see the hash of the compiled source and see it on different gateways or run your own gateway or access it natively on the IPFS network. You can, there's, there's so many ways that you get to be in control. And why is that important? Because if I die and hex.com goes offline and pulsechain.com goes offline, it doesn't matter. Now, I think that I'll, I won't be able to make the world a better place anymore if I'm dead. It's unfortunate. But your ability to run the code that you want won't be impacted. Because you have the code. You have the power. You are the network. It only exists because you will it into existence through your communication with your peers, your association with your peers, a truly decentralized, open source, peer-to-peer -peer network. It's nice to brag about all the things that uh, we're involved with and that, you know, I've invented or founded that just work better than other things. So, for instance, yesterday or the day before, Uniswap uh, went down. Why? Because some Cloudflare thing went down. Well, PulseX didn't go down. Now, why is that one part bad for Uniswap, one part good for Uniswap? One part bad because, hey, it'd be nice if your website just didn't go down. Hex doesn't go down. Pulse Chain doesn't go down. To the best of my knowledge, neither Hex nor Pulse Chain has ever been down. Um, but almost every other website has <laughs> Microsoft, Google, it, Amazon, you name it. it. It's really good fortune and good design. So, you know, I'm, I'm ragging on Uniswap a bit for a few reasons. One, they delist things. Two, I'm not sure how decentralized they are. Three, they're dumping tokens on people's heads. Now it's subsequent to some DAO vote or something. Four, they turned on a fee, a 0.5% fee, on their front end. I mean, yeah, okay. It, now, okay, that's the bad things. Here's the good things. They invented free and open source software that you can run on your own, and you don't really need to be flapping your lips and complaining about their front end going down. Because you can just run your own. So, you know, on one side, it's like, hey, guys, do a better job. And then on the other side, it's like, hey, they did a pretty good job. Creating free and open source software is beautiful. Pulse Chain is free and open source software. Thanks, Ethereum. You know, I, I think Ethereum is almost the most secure blockchain that exists. I think Pulse Chain is the most secure blockchain that exists. Now, does anyone care about security in crypto? Apparently not. <laughs> but I do. I care. Um, you know, which is why so few of my followers have money owed to them from FTX or have money owed to them from CRED or have money owed to them from Celsius or have money owed to them from Voyager or have money owed to them from the Winklevi twins, uh, whatever crap they were shilling that was picking up pennies in front of freight trains. And now they have got a complaint against them. Uh, the government wants to screw them up. Yeah, it turns out when you lose people's money that you are entrusted with, the world gets angry at you. Guys, guess what? I 
you, I feel great because I don't have your money. I don't have anything that I could do to your money. I don't have it. You have it. Your coins, your keys, your network. It's all you. That's the difference between free and open source software in the blockchain and centralized companies and scams and why why are you having to beg people to do stuff for you? That's the opposite of why crypto exists. Can I please get my money? Can I please send something? Can I please, please, please put the front end up? Please, oh, please. Guys, cryptocurrency was invented to empower you, to give you the power to disempower these disgusting middlemen. Middlemen that remove your privacy, remove your freedom, restrict you, control you. All the opposite of, of the Fourth Amendment. And by the way, we have other rights. We don't just have a right to be free of unreasonable search and seizure. We also have a right to bear arms. Well, if weapons technology is considered arms, and if encryption itself is considered weapons technology, well, you could make the argument that cryptocurrency is protected under the Second Amendment. Now, I haven't seen anyone make that argument, but I don't know why. Here's another thing. You've got a right to contract. One of the few things that everyone agrees that the government really should be concerned with and really should be doing is enforcing contracts between people. You have a right to contract. I believe it was enshrined uh, in a case called Lochner, L-C-H-N-E-R, but you know, don't quote me on it because I'm just doing this stream of consciousness. I don't have any internet in front of me. Um, you've got a right to freedom of movement. You've got a right to freedom of association. Blockchains are peer-to-peer -peer networks that are association. You've got a right to freedom of speech. Blockchains are speech. You're just speaking data to other people, your peers, and you're making it public. Things that you're going to make public have a higher degree of protection against censorship. So if the government seizes property from you that was going to be made public, and you notify them that they're violating that law, you can receive financial compensation in return. And this has happened. But if you don't notify them and they didn't know they were violating that rule, then they won't be found guilty and you won't get paid. And so actually knowing your rights is important to, one, help these guys not break the law, and two, um, protect your privacy, and three, if your privacy is violated, receive financial compensation. Now, you'll find these um, links on the Richard Hart Twitter. What else? So there's all, these, there's all these rights that you have that are being trampled on. And the most effective way that you can fight back, the most affordable and effective way that you can fight back, is to submit relevant and substantive comments to proposed rules. It makes a difference. And... If you look at it abstractly, if part of the problem with the governments of the world right now is that there's too much regulation and it cripples progress, well, the regulators also have regulations that cripples rulemaking. And so the heavier their load, the harder it is for them to make rules, whether they be good or bad. And you might say that that could counterplay, you know... How else are you supposed to counterplay a bad rule other than commenting? Because it's, it's, it's a – if the founding fathers knew that there was an unelected fourth branch of government that had millions of employees, very highly paid employees um, that were not elected, these are not the judicial branch, they are not uh, the legislative branch, but they're writing law, you're like, well, guys, you know – it's kind of a violation of the due pro it's kind of a violation of due process and the separation of powers doctrine if the people writing laws aren't legislators that's what legislators jobs are and it's an abdication of uh, authority t to just give like it i see so many problems with what's going on and it's great that the supreme court is uh, fixing a lot of them it's you know because that's how checks and balances are supposed to work but it's kind of a denial of service attack on the judicial branch when the chairman of the SEC says that uh, if you're not losing cases, you're not bringing enough cases, which literally means 
that he is performing a denial of service attack on the judicial. He wants to lose more cases. His words, man, that's not good. That's not good for America. Aren't you losing enough cases already? You're losing cases left and right. Do you really need to lose more? Um, <laughs> I mean, the, the Wall Street Journal just put out an article with the headline that said, will Gary Gensler ever win a case? I think you're losing enough cases, man. And it's not like there's a shortage of scams is the funny part. There are so many scams that are blatant and obvious. And I point them out and I warn you, you know, I warned you about uh, a scam called SafeMoon. It's down nearly 100% and uh, its founders are indicted, both criminally and civilly. I warned you. I did everything I could to protect you. I am quoted in the news as having warned you. And by the way, when I warn you about these things, all the people that are participating in those things insult me. When I warn you about the Bitcoin top, Bitcoin guys insult me. When I warn you about counterparty risk, when I, you know, Mashinsky insults me, blocks me. The Winklevice, every everybody, everybody that I warn you about that says, you know, I, I try and tell you to watch your butt and I try and warn you and I try and protect you. I eat personal harm from doing that. And so I don't know what else I can do to, to try and make a difference, to try and make an impact. I'm doing everything I can. I'm working at 100% capacity to try and make the world a better place. I, I hope that one day more people will know what I've done and what I'm doing. And it's sad that the people that uh, they get so many eyes and ears are disgusting scammers. People that represent centralized companies, people that have promoted centralized companies, people that have got their followers wrecked, ex-cons, you name it. I hate making fun of ex-cons, but it's, uh, it's not good, man. But look, we've got our two weeks we got uh, like 10 days left on the IRS comments. We got maybe, I don't know, 70, 75 days left on FinCEN comments. We've got things going on in Australia and the EU that need comments. If you really want to make an impact in the world, I hate to break it to you, writing comments is going to be a large part of your life for the foreseeable future. And hey, here's the good news. Instead of whining and crying uh, to people that don't matter, you can whine and cry to people that do matter. <laughs> and then you can copy paste your whining and crying with some modifications to the next thing that matters. You know, um, the world's not going to get better on its own. You really have to, to try hard to, to make it happen. And it's what we're doing. And it's working. Now, oh, so what I, what I tell you about the risk that I take to spread truth to you at personal cost to myself, telling you that this uh, recent Bitcoin pump that we've had, I believe, for the perceived activation of a Bitcoin ETF and all the positive things the CEO of BlackRock has said, um, you know, Bitcoin being a flight to quality, things like that. That's nice, right? And I would love to live in a world where cryptocurrency decorrelated from the stock market and from Rolexes and from exotic cars. And it just went on its own and it went to the moon. And nothing else mattered. That'd be great. And there's a lot of people that I guess think that that's what's going to happen. They think that crypto is going to decorrelate from everything else. And that even if everything else goes down, crypto is going to go up. I don't believe that. Now, um, Hex decorrelated hard as heck. I think it went up 20 or 30x when I called the Bitcoin top back at 65k. Boy, Richard Hart, good job. Well done. Yes, thank you. Um, I called that top like a boss, didn't I? The, uh, the problem is if the government sells the Finex coins from the Finex hacker, the Silk Road coins from the Silk Road hacker, if X FTX dumps its, I don't know, I think they've been authorized to do like 50 or 100 million in dumps a week. And if Mt. Gox coins come out, which let's just be serious, Mt. Gox coins have been sitting in the Japan trustee for so long now that it, it will be hard to believe when they actually do come out. And it will be a travesty of justice if they never come out. 
um, to wait a decade for your stolen coins to have be unstolen from you is insane. I just, it's really unfortunate. And, and the blockchain solves this, by the way. Because when you don't give your keys and your coins to somebody else, they can't steal them from you. Or at least they're extremely less likely to do so. They'd have to like hack your computer and you'd have to have your keys and your computer and all this other stuff. You know, cryptocurrency solved this better than anything I'm aware of. The best solution to centralized entities, getting hacked for your data, your phone number, your email, your access logs, your nudes, uh, your crypto, your money. The best solution to all that is decentralization, period, period. And so people that use crypto direct, directly solve the problem of middlemen stealing your stuff. Now, what risk do you still have? You've still got contract risk. You've still got, you know, solar flare risk. The whole the whole world could get nuked. Everyone's got that risk every day. You know, um, you've still got to, like, hide your seed words, you know, make sure you don't have keylogger. But look, if it was that easy to get hacked in crypto, you'd actually see a lot more hacks. There's millions and millions and millions of users, and only a very small subset of them get hacked. So... That speaks very well to the security of the system. So what we're we talking about privacy, robustness, the core principles, trying to protect. You know, half of this talk I'm giving you here is to try and help protect you guys from more scammers. There are people that are owed money by FTX and own tokens and centralized companies, and promote centralized companies that want to take your money from you and put it at risk. Man. I got to tell you that picking up pennies in front of freight train stuff has worked out real bad a whole bunch of times. Maybe stop doing that. Bitcoin is the best performing asset in the history of man. Cryptocurrency is the best performing asset class in the history of man. Why do you need to screw that up by taking counterparty risk? Stop. It's the opposite of why cryptocurrency was invented. You know, the things that I found that if I die and all the sites go offline don't matter. It doesn't matter because people are in the network. You have no expectations of profit from the work of others. There's nobody working for you. There's nobody handing you checks. You are the network. It is data. It is knowledge. It is speech. And it is you. And it is no one else. You and your peers. That's it. And all these other systems, they're not that way. Some guy can screw you out all your stuff. Well, <laughs> stop doing that. Stop doing not crypto. Do actual crypto. Um, well, anyway, so me taking personal risk and eating slings and arrows of outrageous fortune to educate you and tell you the truth, I I think that the stock market is going to crash. I think the everything bubble doesn't pop with a whimper. I think it pops with a pop. And, you know, I think that house prices should go down as rates have to keep going up if they're going to hit their 2% target, which they seem to be very serious about wanting to do. And yes, it looks like there might be some short pause here. But how long can the pause be if there's still inflation and people can barely afford food and it's the most unlivable it's ever been? If you Now, when I say unlivable, I mean your ability to afford your home when you look at rent or mortgage costs is the worst it has ever been. The increases in rents and mortgages are the highest they've ever been versus the actual income potential of a human on average. That is not sustainable. And I don't really see it getting better without prices coming down. So if, now look, the way that this argument fails is if they give up on the 2% price target and they decide to go full on hyperinflation and get, you know, Argentina style with it and just have 20, 30%, 100% a year inflation. And then, yeah, everybody's numbers can go up. Their actual wealth won't go up, but denominated in dollars, which are flying through the floor in value. Now, now, here's the funny part. When I say dollars flying through the floor in value, it's not versus other currencies. The DXY dollar index is up versus other currencies. But your purchasing power to be able to buy, say, a cheeseburger or a house or a car or almost anything else is pitiful. And so the dollar will gain strength versus other currencies, but it will lose value against almost anything else. And And the thing I try and teach you that almost no one else in the world will teach you or can teach you is inflation is just a measurement of how much money has been printed versus how much stuff there is. Now I will add a little nuance there. Credit is money. It spends the same. 
So if you, if you say, Hey, I'll, I'll paint your house. If you give me a hundred dollars and then you give me the hundred and then I paint your house. Okay. One house got painted and a hundred dollars got transacted. But in actuality, I could have accepted the money after I painted your house. And then $200 existed because $100 of work got done and then the other 100 was still there. And so credit actually creates money. And, you know, one of these things that you see in the charts when you research them historically is that the stocks have dropped after the Fed has pivoted to lower rates. And the Fed is usually pivoted to lower rates because the credit markets have frozen. And the credit markets have frozen because why would they lend to you? at, you know, two or three percent or five percent or six percent or whatever, when they could just wait a couple months and lend it to the government for more with no counterparty risk. They have the value of the currency risk. Can, can you imagine how many I, I think that there's trillions of dollars of people that bought government bonds at single digit and lower percent returns, which was a bet that the government would never ever raise rates from near zero. Man, did that bet work out poorly for those guys. You would have been better sitting in cash, homies. Um, and, and then these are the guys that are going to try and tell you what you should do with your money. A country that is bankrupt is going to tell you what you should do with your money. Bank Bankers, go look at the index of bank stock prices. They're demolished. And why shouldn't they be? Because they gave all their money to the government at 0% rates and nobody wants that 0% paper when they can go get big return paper from the government. You know, you can get a a three-month T-bill for 5% return annualized. So it's good talking to you guys. I want you to know I'm looking out for you. I care about you. You matter tons to me. Please try and make the world a better place. The game is about robustness, privacy, security, decentralization, and relevant and substantive comments. I wish you guys the maddest of gains. I'll talk to you later.